My name is Johnny Burtka, and on behalf of the Committee for Responsible Foreign Policy, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's lecture entitled The Negative Impact of the Unnecessary War on Terrorism. This evening's presentation provi pr provides us the sobering opportunity to learn about how America's 17 year and counting war on terror undermines our strategic interests in the Middle East and threatens the safety and happiness of the American people. Before we get started, I'd like to say a brief word about our host today. The Committee for Responsible Foreign Policy brings together people from across the political spectrum on a monthly basis to discuss the most important issues relating to national security with the aim of restoring the authority of the Constitution in order to create a more peaceful and secure world. In their own words, the Committee for Responsible Foreign Policy believes that the United States must pursue a realistic and restrained foreign policy. Foundational to responsible and thoughtful foreign policy is the need for congressional consent for all acts of war. Too often, Congress has taken a back seat in directing military actions, acquiescing to the President. The Constitution spells out in Article I that the authority to authorize war comes exclusively from Congress. And we gather here today in the shadow of Capitol Hill to assess the negative impact of America's war on terror, which has cost the U.S., which has cost U.S. taxpayers over $2 trillion, $600 billion more than World War I, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War combined, taken the lives of 4,400 troops and injured 32,000 more, and destabilized an entire region by creating U.S.-made fail states in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and Libya, which provide terrorists more space and cover to train than Afghanistan ever offered to begin with. But perhaps, as our foreign policy elite often argue, the human, economic, and national security costs have been worth it. As the saying goes, we fight them over there so we don't have to fight them here. If that were true, what about the numerous incidents of, quote, backdraft terrorism, including the Boston bombing and the Orlando Pulse nightclub shooting that were in part motivated, according to the terrorists themselves, as a reaction to Americans' Afghan war? And how about the global migrant crisis facing Europe as tens of thousands of refugees flee war-torn Middle Eastern countries for the shores of Greece, Spain, and Italy? Surely these outcomes must be indicative that something has gone terribly awry. And yet, in the face of 17 years of evidence to the contrary, the only response from our politicians, pundits, and generals is more money, more troops, and more war. Tonight's speaker, perhaps better than anyone else, has demonstrated why this formula will only lead to more problems. Scott Horton is the author of Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, which former Congressman Ron Paul called an important contribution to this vital effort of understanding the folly of Washington's warmongers. Harvard Stephen Walt praised it saying, even readers who do not share Horton's libertarian worldview are likely to find themselves nodding in agreement. The war in Afghanistan has indeed become a fool's errand. And investigative journalist Gareth Porter dares anyone to read it who wants, quote, the full truth about this sword exercise in American imperial power. Scott is the managing director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, host of Antiwar Radio on Pacifica 9. 90.7 FM KPFK in Los Angeles, and podcast The Scott Horton Show from scotthorton.com. He has conducted more than 4,800 interviews since 2003. His articles have appeared at antiwar.com, The American Conservative, History News Network, The Future of Freedom, and The Christian Science Monitor. He is a fan, but no relation to the lawyer from Harper's. Scott lives in Austin, Texas with his wife, investigative reporter Larissa Horton. Please join me in welcoming Scott to the podium. All right. Well, thank you all very much for having me here tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, so the first thing is, um, I'm going to say a bunch of anti-war stuff. And so I want to disclaim just a little bit that uh, plenty of combat veterans 
from the 21st century terror wars agree with me. Uh, former CIA officers, um, military officers, including a full bird colonel here who endorsed my book, Colonel McGregor, uh, plenty of lieutenant colonels and captains and majors and uh, specialists too uh, who fought in Afghanistan and in Iraq tell me that they appreciate the book and uh, that it's a good thing. And I say that not just to disclaim, but also to, in a way, pick a little bit of a fight. Uh, the Hawks always hide behind the enlisted men with all of their arguments for any intervention. And to oppose their plan for remaking whatever country is to backstab the soldiers, is to sell them out. The only way to support the troops is to support their policy, they say. And that's frankly just wrong. And especially in the United States of America where it's supposed to be a limited constitutional republic with full civilian, not just the president, but the people as the sovereign power in the country have civilian supremacy over the military. And military men, mostly young men when they join, their job is to do or die. And they trust, as they're taught in their public school system and in everything else, that in the democracy, the adults, the civilian population of the country will discuss and debate and argue and figure out what to do and will vote and will choose the best leaders. And those best leaders will only send them on missions that endanger their lives when it's absolutely necessary, as they put it, to fight for our freedom, to fight to protect us, to protect their mom and dad and little sister back home. That's what they are told they're volunteering for, not to implement the grand strategy of some egghead at a think tank who's never been in a fight in his life and who has a great plan for offensive war against people who've never attacked us. And so it's just wrong that we're not supposed to discuss this. And in fact, it's, as we'll see, it's really wrong that supporting the war is supporting the troops at all. The foreign policy is a betrayal of American uh, soldiers and Marines. All right. So now, the war on terrorism itself, the hard truth, I guess, for people to swallow, but the most important one is that America started it. This is not a case of, of foreign civilization that is intent on coming and destroying all that is good, true, and beautiful in Western civilization because they have nothing better to do. In reality, America picked this fight. And I'll go through this real quick because we're kind of short on time and I don't want to dwell too much on the facts. And I think you guys probably know a lot of this history, although maybe not as told with this narrative. But Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan, they backed the Afghan Mujahideen, and they backed a lot of Arab fighters who went in the 1980s to fight against the Soviet Union. And they did that in order to, in their words, give the Soviets their own Vietnam, a no-win, destructive quagmire that would break the bank, destabilize their country. They also both backed Saddam Hussein in his attack and eight-year war against Iran in an attempt to contain the results of the Iranian Revolution of 1979, when led by Shiite religious leadership, they overthrew the American sock puppet dictator, the Shah Reza Pahlavi. And so America supported Saddam Hussein in that war. I think we pretty much, everybody knows that we're on the same page so far, okay? Then we get to the 1990s, and Saddam Hussein has a dispute with Kuwait over war debts, and he invades. And there was more to it than that, but to sum it up. And America launches what's known as Operation Desert Storm, uh, the Iraq War I, basically, to drive Saddam back out again. And of course, right around this time, the Soviet Union is falling apart, the Cold War is ending, and the Soviets are withdrawing from Afghanistan. Uh, and something that many people know, but maybe not everyone remembers, that in the aftermath of the first Iraq War, there was a Shiite uprising in the south of the country and also the Kurds in the north as well. And George Bush personally, Bush Sr., the president, encouraged this in a message on Voice of America and had the Air Force drop leaflets encouraging 
these uh, army divisions to rise up and to overthrow Saddam Hussein. Now's your chance. But then they balked and they changed their mind and they called it off like the Bay of Pigs. They put them out there and then they left them. And the reason why they did is because they realized that Iranians and Iraqis who had taken Iran's side and fled to Iran in the Iran-Iraq war, well, they were coming across the border and they were taking the leadership over the Shiite uprising. And James Baker and Brent Scowcroft and George Bush Sr. said, oh no, we're reversing Ronald Reagan's policy of backing Saddam to contain Iran. We're now importing the Iranian revolution into Iraq. We didn't mean to do that. So they call it off. And Saddam was allowed to keep his tanks, enough tanks and attack helicopters that he massacred as many as 100,000 people in putting down that insurrection. This is in the aftermath of the first Iraq war. And then this became then the reason, the excuse, for the Americans to stay in Saudi Arabia, to keep the base. They already had some, but they had expanded massively in order to launch Iraq War I. And they decided they needed to keep those bases now to wage the no-fly zone air patrols over Iraq in order to, in the name of protecting those they just betrayed, in the name of protecting the Shiites. And of course, to enforce uh, the United Nations blockade and sanctions regime against Iraq. And this then, under George Bush Sr. and Bill Clinton, this is the policy that turned the freedom fighters, the Mujahideen heroes that Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan had supported in Afghanistan into the enemies of the American people. And in fact, Abdul Azam, who was bin Laden's mentor and the kind of founder of proto-Al-Qaeda, had told Eric Margulies back in 1986 that as soon as we're done with the uh, Soviets, we're coming for you next. Because you are, he called, them in, called America imperialist. And Eric Margulies had never, actually he's a, a famous reporter, friend of mine, war reporter. Um, he said he had never heard anyone except an anti-American pro-Soviet communist call America an empire. And he just laughed and said, what are you talking about? We are here helping you to fight the Soviets. And he said, yeah, but you're an empire too, because look at what you're doing with your building up the Carter Doctrine in the Persian Gulf, building your bases and dominating our part of the world, supporting uh, governments that we don't approve of. And so this is going to change. And that was early warning right there. Okay, so in the 1990s, Al-Qaeda started attacking and there are quite a few attacks the assassination of Rabbi Kane in New York City in 1990, the first World Trade Center bombing, there were attacks overseas, including the Kobar Towers attack in Saudi Arabia, which for political reasons was blamed on Iran, when in fact it was Osama bin Laden and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed who had done it and killed who? They killed 19 American airmen who were stationed there for the air patrols over Iraq and the no-fly zone bombings over Iraq and the American people were deprived of the truth of what was going on there uh, when they muddled the issue by blaming it on the Iranians. And all this time during the 1990s, Al-Qaeda's strategy was to provoke an overreaction. And people cite Beirut and Somalia, in fact Bin Laden cited Beirut and Somalia and said it's easy to make the Americans turn and run. But he also said that he was trying to bait America into a full-scale war in Somalia in 1993, that he wanted to wage a war of attrition against us there. He wanted to replicate the war that America had helped him wage against and helped the Afghans wage against the Soviet Union in Somalia as early as 93. And then after he uh, was exiled from Sudan and, and moved to Afghanistan in 1996, the game was to try to get America to overreact. So in my book, I quote an interview from 2010. Osama bin Laden was still alive at this point. It's an interview in Rolling Stone magazine with one of Osama bin Laden's sons, not one of his terrorist sons, but one that gives interviews to Rolling Stone magazine. He said, my father's dream was to bring the Americans to Afghanistan. He would do the same thing he did to the Russians. I was surprised the Americans took the bait. I so much respected the mentality of President Clinton. He was the one who was smart. When my father attacked his places, 
He sent a few cruise missiles to my father's training camp. He didn't get my father. But after all the war in Afghanistan, they still don't have my father. They have spent hundreds of billions. Better for the Americans to keep the money for their economy. In Clinton's time, America was very, very smart. Not like the bull that runs after the red scarf. I was in Afghanistan when Bush was elected. My father was so happy. This is the kind of president he needs. One who will attack and spend money and break the country. I'm sure my father wanted Senator McCain more than Obama in the 2008 election. <laughs> McCain has the same mentality as Bush. So instead of cowering and saying, oh no, we have really tough macho Republicans who are willing to unleash American power, unlike Bill Clinton, we better be careful. Instead, Osama bin Laden saw the perfect mark. George Bush and Dick Cheney, two guys that if he provide, well, and they're a team, people that if he would provide them the pretext that they would exploit it, that they would take full advantage. So it's not that George Bush was naive and fooled by bin Laden so much as he cynically exploited the opportunity that bin Laden gave him just as bin Laden was betting that he would. And what he wanted more than anything else was to get the Americans to invade Afghanistan to replicate the same fight that they had against the Soviets with our help a generation before. And in fact, Alan Cullison, a reporter for the Wall Street Journal, got his hands on a letter that bin Laden wrote to Mullah Omar shortly after the war began in 2001, after September 11th, when they were being bombed severely and their government was being overthrown. And bin Laden wrote in this letter to Mullah Omar, listen, I know things look bad now, but believe me, in 10 years, the Americans, just like the Soviets before them, will be bled dry and they'll be forced to leave in humiliation. If they if they leave now, they'll be humiliated. If they leave then, they'll be broken. So please don't be mad I got you into this mess, Mullah Omar. It's for the greater good, he said. Okay, so oh, I should have held up my book I was quoting from, right? All right. Okay, so George Bush did exploit it. He exploited it beyond any reason. And I talk about in the book how they could have negotiated over bin Laden in good faith and gotten him from the Taliban without a war at all. And even if you don't believe that, they certainly didn't need to take over the whole country and create a new government and make enemies of all of its enemies uh, or anything like that. And that was the, the uh, you know, gigantic step that they took to declare that they were going to create a new democracy and a whole new way of life for the people of Afghanistan. But then most famously, Bush started Iraq War II. Absolutely unnecessarily. Even now, it's unanimous. Everyone calls it completely uncontroversial. A war of choice. In other words, an aggressive war. Something that absolutely did not have to happen at all. And so we fought it for five years, but what's the point? What's to learn really from what happened in Iraq War II? Well, what the Bush guys thought was that they were going to gain dominance, they were going to help the Shiite majority of Iraq gain dominance, and then they would have dominance over the Iraqi Shiite majority. So when they launched that war, they really picked up right where George Bush Sr. had left off, installing the Iranian-backed militias and their political factions in power in the country. And once they started, there was no way to turn it off. The Ayatollah Sistani said, we're not going to have hand-picked leaders. We're going to have one man, one vote, unless you want to start the war all over again. And at that point, other than just leave, the only option for the Bush administration was to help the Shiite supermajority win that civil war and, most importantly, complete almost entirely the sectarian cleansing of Baghdad of almost all of the Sunnis, creating a new Iraqi Shia stand, breaking the country creating this new Shia stand from Baghdad down to Kuwait and over to Iran. And then their bet, of course, didn't play out, didn't pan out. It was the Iranians who the new Iraqi regime were far more friendly with and far more dependent on. And so once America was done winning the war for them, they said, thanks, now you can get the hell out. We don't need you. We don't want you. They hadn't accomplished what they wanted. They had in com accomplished exactly the opposite of what they were trying to do. In backing the Shiite side in the Civil War, they ended up empowering Iran. Well, 
Now in reaction to losing that civil war and the process of losing that civil war on the Sunni side, they were then pushed into a brutal insurgency. And you know, hundreds, certainly hundreds of thousands of people, as many as a million people died in the civil war there. And on the Sunni side, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which had never existed before the war, uh, only in Colin Powell's imagination and UN speech did it exist. But after the war, in fact, a year and a half into the war, at the, in the fall of 2014, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi declared that he was loyal to Osama bin Laden and his goals and named his group Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And so Western Iraq, George W. Bush had handed to Iran's friends, and I'm sorry, Eastern Iraq, and Western Iraq he had handed to Osama bin Laden's friends. Now the miracle here was the so-called awakening and David Petraeus and the U.S. Army get the credit for it, but that's not really what happened. Really what happened was, it was the American Army had pushed the Iraqi Sunni population into working with these guys in the first place. But they made themselves very unwelcome rather quickly. And the Iraqi Sunnis started turning on them and killing them as early as 2006. And so this was just the greatest stroke of luck. I mean, George Bush gives all of Western Iraq to Al-Qaeda guys, and then the locals just basically virtually almost entirely eliminate them for us. And that was amazing. And it was convenient for Bush because, and this is the second point that I think is the most important uh, thing to learn, to understand about Iraq War II, was what Seymour Hersh, the investigative reporter, called the redirection. And that was in 2006 when Zalmeh Khalil Zad and others in the administration finally got it through to Bush that we really have just fought a war for Iran's friends and we are going to lose out at the end here. And boy, are the Saudis angry at us and we've got to do something. And so they started the redirection to try to make up for their massive pro-Iranian blunder that they would go back to the Saudis and their allies and work harder uh, on, on uh, the goals of the Sunni alliance in the region. But there's a problem, and that is that Saudi doesn't really have an army, just Al-Qaeda. And Saudi had backed the Sunni-based insurgency against the Americans in Iraq War II. And then just like Al-Qaeda were the, were the leftover mercs who had fought in Afghanistan in the 1980s, and then went on to cause all this trouble, well, the generation of jihadis that fought in Iraq War II, well, they started coming home. And one of the places they came home to was Libya, where Saudi Arabia and America and NATO then immediately took their side. George Bush had given them Western Iraq accidentally. Obama deliberately took the side of the Libyan veterans of Al-Qaeda in Iraq starting in 2011 in that war against Muammar Gaddafi. And then even the New York Times has it, Hillary Clinton, thinking she's clever, called it her bank shot. We'll take all the jihadists and the guns from Libya and we'll send them on to the next one in Syria. And by choosing, and for the very reason, again, for the same policy of the redirection that George Bush had started, a beginning to back Al-Qaeda type fighters. Uh, Bush had started in Lebanon, in Syria, and in Iran. And then Obama was continuing this policy. And so even as he explained it perfectly in a conversation with Jeffrey Goldberg in The Atlantic, that the whole reason to do this, to try to get a regime change against Assad, to back the Sunni insurgency, the Al-Qaeda-led Sunni insurgency against Assad, was to hurt Iran. It wasn't to protect the people of Syria or something like that. It was because George Bush had given Iran's best friends Baghdad and there was nothing that we could do to reverse that, but maybe we can get a consolation prize by taking out Iran's last Arab allied state, or second to last now, in, in Bashar al-Assad. And that was the reason that they did it, and that was the reason that what they did essentially amounts to treason. Because where George Bush had accidentally done the greatest thing for Osama bin Laden that anyone could have ever imagined, Obama doubled it and he did it deliberately. And he knew and we all knew from 2011 on that the Saudis are sending jihadists to Syria to fight. 
That's what's left of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, the Islamic State of Iraq, it was calling itself already then, was going to Syria and was taking charge of the revolution against Assad in Syria. And they knew it all along, and they did it anyway. So here, the American people only have one enemy force on the planet, and that is Al-Qaeda. And yet our government prefers our enemies, Al-Qaeda, to their enemies, Iran, and the axis of Shiite power in the Middle East that's never done anything to us, but stands in the way of their goals of hegemony, military dominance over that region. So how can we continue to have these people as our security force when this is the level of bait and switch that they would stoop to? When the American people give them the writ to protect us from those who would do the September 11th attack and they turn right around within just a few years, they're backing those very same men, sworn blood oath loyal to Ayman al-Zawahiri, the butcher of New York City. And they're the men that our government prefers because Assad and Iran back Hezbollah, which did not knock, knock our towers down, but is, you know, a hassle for Israeli and American policy in the region. Um, in, uh, and, and if you listen to them now, they say, well, the Islamic State is defeated. Oh, I left. This result in the rise of the Islamic State then, and Iraq War III, when the support for the jihadists meant that one of these groups that broke off from Al-Qaeda, they took complete control of, Western, of Eastern Syria and Western Iraq for three full years from 2014 through 17. The war only ended one year ago, Iraq War III, but they seized Fallujah, Ramadi, Mosul, and all the, all the cities of Western Iraq, as well as in Eastern Syria. So now that that war is finally wrapping up, and with the help of the United States uh, in Iraq War III, which again in Iraq was fought for, guess who? Again, the same Shiite militias that they wish they hadn't fought for in Iraq War II were the ones who rousted the Islamic State out of the Sunni regions for us. And then they say now that we have to stay in Syria because Iran is there more than ever before. But Iran is only there because they came to help save Syria from the Al-Qaeda terrorists that the CIA was supporting. And so now they're there more than ever before. And our government's priorities are still completely backwards compared to what the American people would expect would be the prioritization of keeping bin Ladenite terrorists and insurgent movements at an absolute minimum in all cases. In 2011, the great Jeff Huber, who died way too young, uh, he was a former, I think, Navy captain, and he wrote an article called Osama bin Laden, dead and loving it. <laughs> and it was about how he got everything he wanted so and it was on his way to getting everything he wanted. We overthrew the secular Ba'athist dictatorship in Iraq for him, created all that mess, all that destabilization, and we were already beginning to move on to Libya and Syria. And Jeff Huber said, eat your heart out, Charlemagne. Nobody, no general ever moved this many men with this little effort. As this man is hiding in the attic from his own wife even, and, uh, and yet has America at its beck and call accomplishing all of his goals. Okay, so I already did flip the page. Uh, back at the dawn of the Cold War, William F. Buckley, the founder of the National Review magazine, and you could say the founder really of the post-war conservative movement in America, wrote an essay for Common Wheel magazine where he said, listen, we must accept a totalitarian bureaucracy on our shores because of the danger of the Soviet Union the emergency requires it even with Truman at the reins of it all and so that was the deal back then it was not a controversial point of view to think of the national security state as an alien system that was from outside of the American Republic and that the military and the intelligence services were to have such sway over the future, but that that's the way it absolutely has to be to protect us from the global communist conspiracy. That was the line. But that line expired more than 25 years ago. The Soviet Union ceased to exist. 
and yet somehow the permanent emergency didn't. And the totalitarian bureaucracy has only gotten that much worse. And just in the 21st century, we've had all different Patriot Acts. Who can name all the different new laws that they've passed to surveil us in every way? And that's not just Snowden, you know, as he revealed this, the NSA, but the CIA too, doing domestic spying on virtually all American citizens without limit. We have a $20 trillion national debt that everyone's, what, just whistling past a graveyard, pretending is not a problem. Someone else will take care of it another day. Uh, they say they cut taxes, but they're still way too high to me. And, uh, you know, income taxation itself, perhaps if we hadn't had a terror war this time, we could have had a real conversation about ending income taxation in America. Now, the thought is a million miles away. Uh, the idea sounds crazy, could never happen as long as we have a world empire. And they even call it, unashamedly, unironically, military Keynesianism, an economic policy where we stimulate demand by purchasing military equipment. And one of the greatest believers in this in our society right now and preachers of it, unfortunately, is our president, Donald Trump, who seems to think a measly few billion dollars here or there uh, for a few planes, if, if things were to change, would cause such disruption as to be intolerable, which really is not right in a, a $20 trillion uh, economy as they measure it. Um, and, and, and of course, with that be, is all the corruption. You know, I only started coming to DC in 2014 to do some of these conferences and things. And I really was surprised to see BAE systems and General Dynamics and Lockheed and Raytheon written in lights on these giant office towers and these giant campuses where I thought, really, like, you're not embarrassed at all. This is a matter of the greatest of pride to be the biggest, boldest, you know, most boastful defense contractor, where I thought they would have hidden those campuses back on the far side of the prison from here, where you can't see it. You can't see uh, just how much, you know, kind of gloating goes with the profiteering from our military system. And then, of course, the worst part, and one that is very important to libertarians especially, but you don't have to be a libertarian to know about this and understand it and care about it, although it's the libertarians who've got this right, that it's the government intervention in backing the inflationary money supply in America. Artificial bank credit expansion and artificially low interest rates that cause the booms and the busts. And those policies are necessary to make the war seem free. Bush couldn't have sold you $6 trillion worth of war bonds. And he couldn't have raised our taxes. In fact, they sent us dividend checks in the mail. Remember that? Every taxpayer gets a $300 check in the mail as though it was a dividend for all the profit that we were all making off of invading Iraq, when in fact we were blowing $6 trillion into the stratosphere. And then when we have those booms and the busts, it's the free economy that takes the rap for the consequences of all of the government intervention. Uh, which leads people to then, uh, you know, want to end a free economy more and more and socialize and put government in charge of more and more of the economy all the time. Um, and we have betrayed vets. And I guess that's kind of bold to say, but then, no, I know, I just talked with Major Danny Sherson, current active duty major, was talking about how the Saudis were bankrolling the insurgents that killed his guys out on patrol in Iraq War II, and he's unhappy about it. His guys are dead, and he feels betrayed very by the men who sent them on that mission, and, and somewhat against the American people who tolerated it as well. And you have people who are severely maimed, who will be living the rest of their lives in, in uh, you know, military hospitals, on life support, who will be dependent on care uh, for all this and, and not for an honorable and necessary sacrifice, but for a completely unwise and unnecessary sacrifice. Um, and very importantly, and especially denizens of Washington, D.C. really know a lot about this, 
And this is the growth of executive power in relation, not just the growth of government overall, but in comparison to the other branches of government. It's created a system in the 21st century especially where the executive branch, the presidency and the departments, sometimes separate even from the presidency, are virtually lawless where they make a mockery even of the idea of law. And here are a few examples of that. In 2002, Ron Paul, the anti-war Republican, was on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Foreign Relations, I guess, and he was against Iraq War II, but he filed a declaration of war and forced the rest of the Foreign Affairs Committee to vote on it, up or down. And Henry Hyde, the chairman of the committee, the Republican chairman of the committee, chastised Dr. Paul and said that part of the Constitution is an anachronism. We don't do it that way anymore. Now, we didn't amend it and repeal that part. We just don't like it. And so what we do now is we pass authorizations. We pass the buck. We pass the responsibility to the president so that when his war goes bad, we can say, well, I just voted for the authorization for him to decide. I didn't think he'd use it, which is, you know, the Hillary Clinton line and many others. They do hide behind that. But the law is the law and the Constitution isn't vague on this question whatsoever about who has that war power and how it's to be implemented. Another major example is a clip that is somewhat famous from the Bush years when they were bogged down in scandals of torture, and I think this was specifically about spying. A reporter uh, cornered uh, Jay Rockefeller, the senator from West Virginia, who was the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee at the time. And he said, well, as chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, isn't there anything that you can do to find out more about what's going on with the wiretapping? And the, there's Stellar Wind program and all this, and I guess it was 05, 06. And and Jay Rockefeller, the senator, got really upset at the guy. And, and you can tell he wasn't really upset at the reporter. He was upset at the situation. And he goes, what do you think? Do you think that just because I'm the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee that they give me anything at all? Let me tell you something. That's not how it works. Quit being foolish. The way it works is I beg and they give me what they want to give me. And I can't do a thing about it. And that's the chairman of the Senate committee with oversight authority over the CIA and the NSA, pleading absolute helplessness. And that's John D. Rockefeller IV. It's not Rand Paul protesting. It's a guy who ought to have been able to get his way on something and could not. Um, and then this one is really outrageous, absolutely outrageous. During the Senate um, torture investigation, the CIA accidentally turned over one of their own internal torture reports to the U.S. Senate investigators. And then what did John Brennan do? He called the cops on them. He, he tried to get the FBI to indict and prosecute Dianne Feinstein's staff who had ultimate clearance to see all of this and accuse them of stealing this document that in fact they had accidentally turned over. And the reaction at the time was somewhat muted in a way, but there were also people who noted that this is really a turning point. This should be marked down in American history as a signpost on the road to total lawless empire. The CIA is not a co-equal branch of government with the United States Senate, or are they? All Brennan should have to say to Dianne Feinstein is, yes, ma'am, you're the chair of the committee, you say, it goes. That's it. And yet things are, have, have become the, the power. In reality, the CIA is that much more powerful than the United States Senate, isn't it? So why should they take a real investigation from her if they feel like they don't have to? And this is a major change, a revolution within the form of what used to be our system of government to something else. And then the biggest example is from our time right now. I don't think there's any secret whatsoever. In fact, it's widely celebrated that our government, the executive departments of our government are in open revolt against the president of the United States for good and for ill. And for ill, here's three examples that we all know for a fact. Donald Trump wants out of Afghanistan. He wants out of Syria and he wants out of Somalia. 
And in all three cases, he's told by the departments of the government, you can't. You have no choice. This is the deal. And in the New Woodward book, it's very blatant and we already knew it, but James Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, outright told Trump, you pull out of Afghanistan, anything bad that happens in Afghanistan after that, I'm going to blame it on you and say I warned you. We, so we have to stay no matter what. And we know that Trump knows better. Why are we in Somalia? I don't care who kills who in Somalia. Why has it got to be our guys that are over there in that? They didn't even explain it. They said, we're trying to prevent someone from blowing up Times Square, Mr. President. It's that the Times Square attack was committed by an American, a Pakistani American who went home to Pakistan and saw the results of one of Obama's drone strikes on a family over there and then allowed himself to be recruited by the Pakistani Taliban that had never attacked us before. That was what caused the attempted, thankfully failed, attack on Times Square in 2010. Um, and so, um, and in fact, just in the last couple of weeks, uh, Donald Trump has said that George Bush's decision to invade the Middle East, as he put it, not just Iraq, but to knock over the whole region the way he did, Donald Trump, our Republican president of the United States of America, said that was the worst decision an American president has ever made. Now, I actually, I would dispute that, but good enough for me. <laughs> and so, according to Donald Trump, the current Republican president of the United States, none of this had to happen. The 21st century did not have to be this way. And now he feels he's stuck with it. Now, the conventional wisdom, and I'm sure you guys have thought a lot about this, is that presidents need wars. As R.W. Apple put it in the New York Times back when Bush Sr. launched the beginning of this Iraq war all those years ago, that presidents have to let blood to join the club as a true leader of this country. And it works. George Bush was reelected in part because of the crisis of the Iraq war that he himself had engineered and gotten us into. And this does work, and, and worse, it's conventional wisdom. And I hear people a lot very worried, people who know a lot of things, very worried that Donald Trump could start a war with Iran just to get reelected, just to make sure that you can't change horses in midstream. You got to stay with your current leaders, the same as worked for Bush in 2004. But I say, forget all that. That's wrong. That, as conventional wisdom usually is, that it's wrong. George Bush Jr., W. Bush, won election in 2000 promising a humble foreign policy. No more of this nation building and intervention and reckless, uh, you know, um, mission creep of the Clinton-Gore years. And it helped him to win. He attacked the warfare state from the right as a conservative and said it's not conservative to do these things. And Barack Obama, now John Kerry didn't really challenge Bush on the war at all, just tried to be like him, so that kind of doesn't count. But in 2008, Barack Obama handily defeated Hillary Clinton in the primaries, primarily because of her vote and support for Iraq War II. And then he handily defeated John McCain for the very same reason that fall. And four years later, it certainly didn't hurt him that Romney was perceived as the far more bellicose leader on foreign policy. And during both of those election cycles, Ron Paul ran for president. And not many people had ever heard of him before. He was just a member of the House of Representatives. But he was anti-war as can be. And I don't know if y'all know this, but Ron Paul in both of those campaigns raised more money, presumably got more votes, but raised more money from active duty and veterans than all the other candidates combined. And that was because he wasn't a liberal. He wasn't Michael Moore. He wasn't saying that you have to stop being a conservative and stop being who you are to stop believing in this nonsense. And millions of people, millions rallied to that. Ron was giving a permission slip to American conservatives, to the American right. If you like your identity, you can keep it but you can change your position on this. And he did not win, unfortunately, but it was extremely powerful. It changed the world forever. Um, and 
Also, look at Trump's own election. Now, he did say a lot of hawkish things about, uh, you know, brutalizing uh, Al-Qaeda and killing their families and these kinds of things. But he also he spent a lot of time attacking trigger-happy Hillary, that reckless interventionist Hillary Clinton who never heard of a war she didn't like. It might as well elect Jeb if we're going to elect her. And that was a big part of the, the explicit strategy of Stephen Bannon when he took over the Trump campaign, that our position is she's responsible for the trade deals we don't like, she's responsible for the immigration patterns that we don't like, and she's responsible for all these wars that now even the American right have the consensus that we don't want anymore. And she lost, and that certainly helped him and there was a study done by some university professors about the most important districts in the, in the swing states in the Midwest. And they said that the counties where more active duties, where more soldiers had died in Iraq and Afghanistan, that those were the districts that went for Trump and against Hillary and turned those states red and secured him that election, right down to the brass tacks. Her idea that you have to, especially if you're a Democrat and especially if you're a woman, that you have to be muscular in your foreign policy and you have to threaten the Russians with a no-fly zone and all this blew up in her face. She helped sink herself and Trump just helped push her down with the same narrative. That's right, she wants to do what she just said she wants to do, more war. And in fact, one more, one more Trump anecdote. In the campaign, at the beginning of the campaign, South Carolina, the third vote, so there were still 17 people in the, in the race. Donald Trump denounced George Bush and Iraq War II and said Bush lied us into war and all this. The next day, he won two-thirds of the vote and the other 17 candidates split one-third. Jeb had brought George Jr. out to help campaign with him and it was like the sad trombone. <laughs> and, this is, and this is in South Carolina, the most heavily militarized state in the Union. But rather than saying, yeah, flags and stuff like that, they said, hey, my little brother died over there. And for what? We're over it now. And they rallied to a Republican anti-war message. So my message then is, for Trump to win re-election, what he should not do is bomb Iran, he should go to Iran. And it would work. He's already proven that he can upset the entire establishment by attempting, and I'm very positive and confident and optimistic about it, to make peace with North Korea. And there are those in his government who would prefer to see things another way. But that looks like it could happen. And the American people absolutely agree. And so if the Bush and Obama redirection policy has our government, our CIA, backing al-Qaeda terrorists because they hate Iran so much, well, maybe we could just make friends with Iran. And they wouldn't feel like they're in such a position that they have to resort to literal treason in order to check the results of the mistakes that they have made. And I think he could do it. And of course, just like they say, only Nixon could go to China. I think Donald Trump is perfect for going to Pyongyang, going to Damascus, going to Tehran, and making friends with all supposedly the last of the rogue states. And as a Republican, I mean, the line, the speech writes itself. I ain't afraid of no Ayatollah, right? right? We can deal with him, right? Now, may, oh, Barack Obama has to spend every last bit of political capital he has to try to get a nuclear deal, but Donald Trump wouldn't have to. He can attack the entire position from the right. And now, obviously, there are a lot of interests in this town who would like to see that not happen. And I am not saying that I necessarily think that Donald Trump has a set of principles that would really guide him in that way. But I do think that his overall reaction is that it's been too long. That how could it possibly be that it takes 18 years to kill 400 men? As something has gone wrong here in a way that pretty much any American could decide by now. And so, in conclusion, <laughs> um, 
And so I think that if Trump knew that the American people, but most especially the American right, were against the war, if when he imagines the American people out the West Wing uh, Oval Office windows there, out there, the Americans of his imagination, do we have his back when he tells the generals no, or do we care at all? And I think that if he thought that he could say with a straight face and quite seriously, I'm sorry, General Mattis, the American people, and even particularly now conservatives, want an end to this policy. We have to figure out something else, then at least he would then be in the correct political position to attempt to do so. And then, so that means that it's up to us to make that the reality for him. Thank you. Scott, uh, you have such a wonderful encyclopedic knowledge of the history of these events. And if only your voice could get heard more elsewhere as well. Uh, my question is, you, you know about everything, nearly. Uh, NATO expansion. Uh, I was at the Council of National Policy when Phyllis Schlafly, an arch-conservative, spoke vehemently against NATO expansion. That triggered, of course, the Russian uh, reaction, and of course the attack on Serbia, which friends of mine have said that eliminated the pro-Americans inside Moscow, inside the government in Moscow. But can you, your knowledge, discuss a bit the expansion of NATO and the attack on Syria as related to the uh, relations to, with Russia? Absolutely. Thank you. The great John Basil Utley, everybody, right? Um, okay, so yes, uh, you're absolutely right that it, what you're getting at there, I think, is that America really started it in our conflict with Russia as well. In the 1990s, uh, I was surprised to see, I actually was really surprised to learn that um, not just George Kennan, who was the original author of the containment policy against the Soviet Union at the dawn of the Cold War, but even Paul Nitze, who had advocated outright rollback and said containment wasn't enough, that Robert McNamara, who was frankly the butcher of uh, Japan, Korea, and Vietnam as well, and, and many other um, you know, very important previous Cold War hawks said, we absolutely must not expand NATO eastward. And probably most famously was George Kennan, who um, told Thomas Friedman in 1998 that he said, I'll tell you exactly what's going to happen here. We're going to expand NATO, our military alliance, and we're going to expand it eastward toward Russia's borders, and sooner or later, we're going to get a bad reaction. All the people who are telling us now, this isn't about Russia, this doesn't threaten Russia, hell, we'll create the NATO-Russia Council, we'll be friends, it'll be fine. We just, this is just about security and weapon sales and it'll be cool. That all those people will then say, see, this is why we need NATO, to contain the Russian aggression that is in fact the reaction to their policy. And so Bill Clinton started it in the mid-1990s. His defense secretary, William Perry, did everything he could to stop him. And, Bill, and, and you think about any president who doesn't want to do something and your secretary of defense also doesn't want to do it, then just hide behind him. My secretary of defense advised me that this is a really bad idea. Like when Gates tried to stop Obama from attacking Libya and then said okay and started the war anyway for him. But, um, but so Clinton ignored him and a big part of it was just domestic politics. There's a lot of Polish vo votes in Illinois and it's an important state. And so that was a big part of what went into consideration. And in fact, uh, James Carden told me a story recently about, I guess he had read Strobe Talbot's memoirs where um, he was one of the engineers of the policy in the Clinton years, and Clinton said to Strobe Talbot, well, I don't know, Strobe, George Kennan is against it. Isn't he your mentor? 
and Strobe Talbot said, ah, he always hated NATO anyway. <laughs> and then that was it. And the, the criticism was ignored and they expanded the policy. And of course, George W. Bush expanded the policy even further. And I was just reading an article this morning on the National Interest about how uh, Mike Pence has just spoken in the last, I think in the last week or two weeks, about uh, the current Trump administration's determination to bring Georgia, former Soviet Georgia, between the Black and Caspian Sea into the NATO military alliance as well, which is something that the Europeans really objected to and prevented George Bush from pursuing uh, back during his time. And of course, they also are continually threatening to bring Ukraine into NATO as well, which is part of the motivation for American participation in the coup of 2014 against their Russian-leaning government there, uh, which has created this current crisis. And then just as Kennan predicted, they say, look at Putin, Russian aggression, Russian ranchivism. They're trying to take over, uh, I said that wrong, uh, they're trying to reconquer Eastern Europe and recreate either the Soviet Union or at least the Tsar's old empire. And it's all directly in reaction to American intervention there. And you mentioned Syria, of course. As I said, Barack Obama started backing the terrorists in Syria in 2011. It wasn't until 2015 that the Russians intervened there. And they did so only when the Islamic State had severed the highway between Aleppo and Damascus and was preparing to march on Damascus. And Vladimir Putin said, okay. In fact, there's leaked audio of John Kerry, who was the Secretary of State at the time, meeting with some uh, Syrian rebel representative exiles in London, and they're saying to him, come on, give us some guns, give us some money. And Kerry says, guys, I'm sorry, Syria is lousy with guns. We gave you so many guns. It didn't work. He said, we saw the rise of the Islamic State, but we thought we could manage and that this could be useful for pressuring Assad to step down from power. But he didn't do that. He went to Moscow and asked Putin for help instead. And so sorry, kids, the game is up now. We're done. And it was, again, just like in Ukraine, and, and I'm not justifying everything the Russians have done in that war. Lord knows they've killed thousands of innocent civilians in their air campaign, as the Americans did in Iraq War III, in Syria, and in Iraq as well. Um, but all of the worst things, from seizing the Crimean Peninsula, um, and to backing the uh, rebels in the Donbass region in Ukraine and uh, their air war in Syria is all in reaction to American policies and American policies that blatantly should never have been pursued in the first place. So it's not to take all of the responsibility away from the Russians who've done what they've done, but it is to put the lion's share of, on, of the blame on the Americans who have provoked them and put them in that situation. Yeah. Oh, we got a mic here. Oh, well done, Scott. Nicely done, um, as always. Thank uh, you. Just, just apropos of the uh, question of treason regarding the enabling of, of Al Qaeda, jihadist terrorism. Uh, I agree with you, of course, uh, completely <coughs> on the fundamental point here. But I wonder if there isn't a previous episode here that comes well before the events that you've described which is in the 1990s in Saudi Arabia when Kobar Towers was bombed and even before that when the, the National Guard, uh, the, the management uh, uh, office of the National Guard uh, was, was bombed in November 1995, uh, we, we have very good evidence here that the, uh, the uh, it was done by Al Qaeda, uh, by people who were a lot who were associated with Bin Laden in Afghanistan. They uh, were beheaded in 1995, in, in 1996, after having blown up the National Guard office. And then, six months later or seven months later, they bombed uh, more Al Qaeda people. Bombed uh, the Kobar Towers, where uh, 273. Americans were injured, and I believe uh, 23 were killed. Uh, and I, I can't remember the exact number at the moment. But uh, what happened was that the CIA found out that the Saudi government was protecting Al-Qaeda. They 
intercepted messages from the government that uh, indicated that they were not going to cooperate with that investigation in any way, shape, or form. They were going to protect the people who were who had carried it out. And without going into more detail, uh, I think the point here is that the CIA understood, and, and the FBI should have understood, that the Saudi government was protecting Al-Qaeda and done something about it, and had they done that, there probably would, almost certainly would not have been an attack in 9-11. It simply wouldn't have happened because they would have been charged with really you know, basically taking care of Al-Qaeda. That's not what happened, and it was because of the support for the Saudi government, despite all that evidence. Well, you got here late, but yeah, I did talk about that. Oh, okay. How they, they blame, by blaming the Kobar Towers attack on Iran, they completely obscured the fact that you have these, you know, extremely radical rightist, religious rightists in Saudi Arabia who will do anything to get American combat forces off of their soil. By blaming it on Iran across the Gulf, now it was what, just kind of a target of convenience and opportunity and they did it for no real reason except how evil Iranians are or something like that. And so there was no lesson to learn from it. And I think you're absolutely right that if they'd been honest about that then, how could they have backed the Kosovo Liberation Army in 1999 after what had happened at Kobar Towers? Uh, how could the CIA have contributed to the Chechen cause in their fight against Russia in the late 90s as well? You know, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the ringleader of the 9-11 plot, earned his stripes fighting for the Mujahideen in Bosnia in 1994 and 1995. And, and I cite in the book, um, Bill Clinton himself, Senator Tom Lantos, and Representative Brad Sherman, after September 11th, all three of them said something to the effect of, ah, geez, why would these guys attack us after we've done so much for them in Bosnia? and in Kosovo and took their side. And of course, the occupation of Saudi and the bombing of Iraq and support for Israel and the other things that had motivated their attacks against us had not changed. So as I say in the book, Bill Clinton had helped to build their forces up but had failed to buy them off and ended up getting 3,000 killed and the rest is even worse history from there. Thank you so much, great analysis. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the Yemen civil war under, that started under Obama and we're in this new moment where there's so much criticism for Saudi Arabia post Khashoggi and how we can work to try to end U.S. support for Saudi Arabia's war on Yemen. Yeah, great question and yeah, it's one of the things I had to skip in the, in the speech but it's another one of the terror wars that is in fact being fought for Al-Qaeda and not against them. Now, I'll do the story quick. I can do this quick. In 2009, Obama comes into power and he tells the CIA, kill Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Bomb them. Well, so they unleash the drone war and all it does is build up Al-Qaeda more and more as we kill innocent people and more and more people rally to their cause. There's a million pieces of journalism about that was exactly the effect. It only backfired. But then in order to get away with waging that drone war, Obama bribed the dictator of Yemen, Abdullah Saleh, with guns and money. And he used the guns and the money to send his army and the Muslim Brotherhood types from the Islam movement to attack a group of Shiites known as rebels, the Houthis, in the north of the country, up in the Sada district. Well, just like Obama, Saleh wasn't really good at it, and everything that he did ended up resulting in the Houthi movement gaining in more and more power and influence every time that he attacked them. They won. It was like four little mini wars in a row there. Then the Arab Spring came and virtually all factions in the country said that they wanted rid of Saleh and to hold elections. And there was an assassination attempt or two. And I guess on the second one he was wounded and he was at home convalescing. And so Hillary Clinton and the Saudis moved in and engineered a regime change where they pushed Saleh out and supported his, the vice president, the successor. I guess that much of it was constitutional, but it was engineered from abroad. Um, and his name was Mansour Hadi. And Hadi had very little political support. He did not have a lot of different factions backing him other than the foreigners. And Hillary, they even arranged literally to have an election with one man on the ballot. One man, one picture, one oval for your check mark. 
and Hillary hailed this as the advent of democracy for the people of Yemen. And the thing is, he just didn't have the, the stature for the position at all. And he also tried to replicate Saleh's same mistake in attacking the Houthis. And in attacking the Houthis, he made them even more powerful. And he also announced a strong federalism plan that would have cut the Houthi region off from the Red Sea. And so that was absolutely something for them to go to war for. But then, here's the punchline, and it's not that funny. It turns out that Saleh, instead of just retiring back to Mount Vernon or something, took the army with him when he left, much of it. And it also turns out that though he was not a Houthi, Saleh was a Zaidi Shia, just like the Houthis, and had that much in common with them, and so formed an alliance with his former enemies in the north of the country. And then they started marching south down to seize the capital of Sana in the middle of the country at the end of 2014, beginning of 2015. Now, the excuse for the war that broke out since then was that the Houthis are controlled by Iran. They're basically the Hezbollah of Yemen. And they're the Iranians, Shiite, cat's paw, because, see, Shiite. And so that's all you need to know. And so that's why we have to do what we have to do. But we know that that's not true because Barack Obama himself, the president who started this war, said on video, admitted that the Iranians had warned their friends, the Houthis, not to sack the capital city, that this would pro provoke a terrible response from the Saudis and then we won't be able to do anything for you. So don't bite off more than you can chew. And the Houthis ignored the Iranians, their supposed masters, and did it anyway. And then the Iranians' prediction immediately came true. And the war was launched. And guess who launched it? It was Mohammed bin Salman, who was then the 29-year-old, brand-new defense minister and deputy crown prince, who had all of his own public choice theory, selfish, personal, political reasons to launch a war to solidify his position as a powerful prince within the kingdom. And it, and it did work, at least at first. It helped, uh, apparently, uh, with solidifying his position as he moved to isolate his cousins and uncles and other uh, challengers to the throne as he made himself now the crown prince. And he's the one that, we're launching, that they launched this war for. And I swear you can find this, and it... Maybe the most relevant quote of the 20th century, 21st century. It's so important to me, I think. I just don't know how to get over it. The Obama administration put a press release in the New York Times. It wasn't a scoop. It was like based on 17 official sources off the record. And they said, listen, we knew that the war would be long, bloody, and indeterminate. Long, bloody, and indeterminate. I mean, they didn't even have an idea what the end game could be. They didn't believe for a minute that, yeah, we'll put Hadi back on the throne. It'll be fine. It'll be long, bloody, and indeterminate. But why are we doing it anyway? We have to placate the Saudis. Because the Saudis are upset that Obama signed the nuclear deal with Iran. Now, if the Saudis were actually worried about an Iranian nuclear weapon, then the JCPOA was great because... The deal locked down the Iranian civilian nuclear program double more than ever before under the Non-Proliferation Treaty and far more than any other non-proliferation regime in history. But that wasn't what they were worried about. What they were worried about was that Obama and America were tilting back toward Iran, that we were going to stop being so close of allies with them. And they had to make moves to assure that that wasn't happening. Now, I think we all understand that that was never in the cards. Obama didn't want a new alliance with Iran. All he wanted was to take the threat of war over their nuclear program off the table. And that was the only purpose of the deal. But the Saudis were afraid that they were losing their place in our order in the Middle East. And that was a huge part of launching the war. And then, according to all of the biggest and most official newspapers, the Americans have been helping pick the targets, helping coordinate all the intelligence, helping obviously, as we all know, with the refueling of the Saudi fighter bombers on the way to their sorties. And the U.S. Navy enforces the blockade with the Saudis off the coast in what they're literally waging a medieval siege warfare, attempting to starve the people of Yemen into submission. And according to the U.N., 
virtually the entire population are in need of food assistance. Prices for the most basic staples are absolutely unaffordable through the roof. Uh, all international trade has been shut down and the people are starving and dying by the tens of thousands. The worst cholera epidemic in living memory broke out last year and unfortunately it hasn't been as bad this year, but thousands of people died of it. Mostly young children die uh, from dehydration, from diarrhea and vomiting themselves to death. And that's the war that we're waging for the most spurious of reasons. A war that, again, this is against the Houthis. This isn't the war against Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. This is the war for Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula against their most bitter enemies, the Houthis. That's what our government does when we give them a writ to protect us from terrorism, because they take the side of our enemies against theirs. Maybe not the best line to leave on, but thank you all very much for listening to me. I appreciate it. Tip your cab drivers well. <laughs>